Well, hello and welcome to our webinar today in our Coping with COVID series. I'm Dr. Wendy Smeltzer, National Medical Director for Wello and Medical Director at Live, our Calgary uh, clinic. So I think we're all aware that we're entering a new stage now in this pandemic where some of our previous public health restrictions are starting to gradually lift and we're starting to see many businesses now reopen or businesses that were open having people return into that workplace. So we are seeing people um, leaving some of the remote work that they've been doing back into their workspaces. People are starting to return to some of the activities that they uh, have been restricted in the past few months. And with this, we're seeing a lot of emotions, a lot of concerns that are arising as this process of relaunch is happening. And also we're starting to see on the other hand, some COVID weariness and complacency starting to occur. So we're really pleased today to have a guest speaker, Carla Neek with us, and she's gonna talk about some of these issues as we reopen. So Carla completed a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and then went on to get a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy. She's had an active clinical practice as an occupational therapist for 17 years and completed a lot of additional training related to her specialty of mental health, including mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, coaching, and many others. And she applies these skills to support clients in preparing to return to work. And following, uh, she's worked with people who've been on extended medical leaves due to mental health conditions or chronic illnesses in past, and has been a provider working with long-term disability insurers and services for veterans affairs and some of our, our, our government agencies. So she's got a lot of experience even pre-COVID in this return to work scenario. So she's here to talk to us today about preparing to relaunch, how to look at our physical, our emotional, our cognitive function as we transition back to work. And she'll look at it both from a personal point of view, an environmental point of view, and through an occupational lens as well. So we're really delighted to have her here today. I'm gonna to ask that any of you that have questions that arise as we go through this, uh, uh, presentation, just put them in the chat function of the webinar um, boxes at the bottom, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end. So over to you, Carlin. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you to Wello for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here and hopefully what I have to share can help as people are going through different transitions. So now the question is, will the Am I be able to advance the slide? Yes, okay. Um, so this is a rough outline of some of the topics that are gonna come up. Um, like Wendy said, well, we'll be looking at physical, emotional, and cognitive um, things. What can we expect in terms of physical, emotional, and cognitive function? What can we do to manage those challenges that are gonna come up? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a small model that helps with some problem solving um, and, and just, the general what can we expect and how can we then learn to apply some of these strategies to different types of work situations. There we go. Um, so I, as Wendy mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist. And most people, people don't know actually what an occupational therapist is. Um, there's a de definition here by Jessica Kensky. Occupational therapy is where science, creativity, and compassion collide. And I would add, to improve function in daily activities. As occupational therapists, we think about that functional output. What are the things we want to and need to be doing um, day to day? And if you're having difficulty, then we work on identifying obstacles and figuring out how we're going to improve your effectiveness, independence, and ability in any of these activities. So this doesn't just have to be about work. Um, it could be the retiree who loves to garden, but osteoarthritis in her knees is getting in the way of doing what she loves the most. Does she need a raised garden bed, some longer tools, a kneeling pad? Maybe she needs to see a surgeon or a physiotherapist for some exercises. It could be a kindergartner who can't put on his own coat um, as occupation. That's the task, the doing of the putting on the coat. Um, or the person who has a brain injury and is having trouble cooking safely. In the case of a workplace, it could be that customer service manager who's overwhelmed and starting to yell more at his kids, miss work, and have trouble focusing at work because anxiety is increasing. 
So function is doing the things you want to or need to be doing. And we OTs believe that as humans, our meaning and purpose are derived from participating in meaningful activity. Advancing the slide. So three areas we've mentioned, physical function, social emotional function, and cognitive function. I'm going to try and relate these to work transitions. Now I could probably talk for about a week about each topic, but I only have 45 or maybe now 40, 38 minutes uh, to do so. So I've chosen some areas that I anticipate will be challenging based on our current pandemic circumstances and based on hoping a lot of people return to work after extended leaves. For most of my career as an OT, I've helped people return to work after being on long-term disability for over a year. I currently am helping two wonderful women prepare to return to work after eight and 13 years away from the workplace, respectively. I've learned a lot of tricks and tips along the way to help optimize our capacity, our coping during these stressful transitions. Now, I recognize that the audience has people from across Canada in attendance, so our stages of rollout may vary greatly. Um, it, province to province across industries and, and people coming to this with their own unique needs, circumstances and abilities. People have different financial situations, different cultural impacts, different home situations, different pre-existing conditions or different workplace challenges. I hope to be able to touch on some useful themes to apply, whether you're continuing to work from home, anxiously awaiting go time or trying to cope with an ever-changing work environment. So this next slide is my simple little model. I'm not going to burden you with a whole bunch of theoretical stuff, but this one is gold. We OTs look at function as a happy dance between person, environment, and occupation. So that little OP in the middle is function. That's our output. A hiccup in any of these factors, person, environment, and occupation can impact function. So we look at look for problems in all those areas and we look for solutions in all of these areas and remembering that our output isn't necessarily just about the person or just about the environment or just about the work tasks helps us to be better problem solvers. So what do we mean by person? Um, that's you and all that you bring with you. It's your big feet, your awesome poker skills, your wicked moonwalk, but also probably possibly your depression, your migraines, your ADHD, and your previous experiences, whether good or bad. As it pertains to work, um, this could be thinking of your skills, strengths, challenges, physical, cognitive, emotional, roles, beliefs, etc. So that's that person bit of our functional puzzle. Next is environment. These are the places that you do the things you need to do. So in this talk, we're focusing on the work environment. So that's the city, the province, the building, the organization, the workplace, the culture, the cubicle or vehicle, the people in that environment you work in. If you're working from home, it might be that makeshift desk like a ping pong table or the old chair you ha still have from university. The loud kids, the dog that wants out every 20 minutes and all the other reminders of the things you need to do in your different roles. This could also be the workplace culture and interpersonal relationships in your workplace. An occupation. In this case of workplace, we're talking about occupation more as that true sense of the word of the things you need to do, but we do know that occupation refers to brushing your teeth, grocery shopping, dancing, parenting, um, or as in our focus today, we're focusing on the working aspect. So that little triangle in the middle labeled OP for occupational performance is where the three come together, person, environment, occupation, and create an output. That's the function. When things are nicely aligned in these three, three areas, our function is optimal. But sometimes we encounter things that cause us to struggle with our function. A concrete example of using this PEO approach is an ergonomic assessment. And later on in this presentation, I'm going to teach you how to do a quick and dirty ergonomic assessment. So I'm occasionally asked if I can do an ergonomic assessment for someone who isn't at work at all. Or sometimes people, when I show up to do the ergonomic assessment, jump into, here's my desk, now fix it. 
But that's not how I look at the situation. I think of the first ask about that functional difficulty. So that middle part of the labeled OP, um, what are you struggling to do? What's the problem here? And then I look at the person. What challenges are you facing? Do you have other medical conditions? Where does it hurt? What's your history? And I look at the job you need to do, that's the occupation. Um, how often do you need to be doing different tasks? Is there flexibility in the way you need to do them? What types of movements do you need to make to do that job? And then I look at that workstation, the environment, the equipment you use, is it a shared workspace? How's the chair, the monitor, the desk, the lighting, the noise, etc. This model can help us to, this PEO model can help us to identify what is impacting function which helps us to then make more effective recommendations. When we can figure out where the problems are, we can see where the solutions are. So I'll share, like I said, a little further down in this presentation, a little bit more about ergonomics. Next slide here. So physical, what can we expect and what can we do? Oh, I think I had a general. going to back up a little bit here. Okay, this one here, what challenges can we expect? So this is a general umbrella thing. Um, I think we can expect a great variability from people. I think we can expect as many different responses, situations, strengths, and challenges as there are people. Collectively, this has been a shared traumatic experience. Thinking about my own experience, there was a time in this where I was less busy with my work. My husband wasn't working. My kids were at home doing their thing like they are on a weekend. Our finances were okay. Um, not great, but okay. And I remember saying, this has been a global crisis disguised as an extended spring break. It was confusing, especially when the stress would creep up on me. And, and I'd be kind of like, why am I stressed? This is I'm feeling okay. But we've been in this collective crisis altogether, whether we're feeling it or not. It hasn't been so easy for everyone. I think of the grocery store clerks on the front lines working long hours with the type of exposure that we've been trying to limit or the healthcare workers adjusting their roles and preparing for the worst. Some people have had limited disruption in our, their lives and then there are people who are thriving in normal, novel situations where creative solutions are needed. They may crash later as the new norm becomes stale. There are people who thrive on predictability and routine, struggling and maybe even resisting change. I've met so many people who appear controlling, trying to control all the things they can't control, but behind it all is it's all this control is an effort to manage anxiety. So I think there's four things that are important to remember, no matter what challenge we're facing here. Trying to remember to approach things with flexibility, curiosity, openness, and compassion. Now these first three things, flexibility, curiosity, and openness are skills of mindfulness. Um, it's been a word that's been around a lot, kind of a buzzword, but John Kabat-Zinn beautifully defines mindfulness as the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So we're paying attention, we're doing it intentionally, we're in the present moment and we're doing it non-judgmentally. And these things lead to compassion. I think of it practically as being like a curious scientist, trying to learn more about a situation without attachment to a theory, but just openly observing, being flexible and curious. So keeping that in mind as a general skill, we're gonna get into physical, emotional and cognitive. What can we expect? What can we do? So from a physical perspective, I think we can expect um, a lot of different physical responses in this pandemic situation. Some people have been using this time to exercise more and they may come back stronger, or better regulated and with less pain. For some, not much has changed. Some of us, I mean them, have been spending more time sitting, eating, maybe even drinking. And as a result, they may be feeling the effects of less strength, lower endurance, poor sleep, more pain. 
people with chronic illness, such as heart disease, diabetes, physical pain conditions, neurodegenerative diseases, arthritis, and so on, they may have seen improvements or worsening depending on how their lifestyle changed during this time. Looking at how the situation has impacted people's physical function can give us a clue as how to help prepare for a return to work. So sometimes it's that working backwards. If I'm experiencing more pain because I was less active, I need to get more active to reduce my pain and be able to tolerate going back to work, as an example. For myself, I, um, I've, I have a bit of an auditory sensitivity, and if I was working in a really noisy environment, I would struggle to go back at this time because I've been in my safe little bubble with the noise from the kids and the dogs. So it's not always, not always quiet. But I also think of the person who is a tradesperson and has to lift and, lift and carry heavy equipment and has lost strength from not doing so. So what can we do? We can start practicing routines of work routines and tasks before the transition. Um, so maybe this is setting sleep times to align with when you'll be needing to be waking for work. Um, I often suggest giving it at least a week before you go back to work. I think the sleep boot camp that's coming up, there's a sleep boot camp webinar coming up uh, through Wello next week. Um, that'll help you if you're having trouble getting your sleep back on track. There's also a previous sleep presentation that the same psychologist, Caroline Sandhurst, gave. Lots of great tips in that, so I won't rehash all of them. More things we can do if you've got reduced strength and you have a physical job, maybe you need to start working on that with exercise. Exercise can look like all the things at the gym, but it can also look like gardening, rearranging furniture, cleaning out the garage, walking. We can also prepare by prepare to maintain routines that support our physical health. Um, so packing healthy lunches and snacks if grazing has become the norm. If you find um, exercise has been fitting in the middle of your day, maybe you need to plan for when you'll be doing that outside of your work hours. It could be a walk outdoors at lunch or before you head to work. And the things we do for our physical health you'll see a theme, um, also help with our mental health, um, our emotional regulation, that sort of thing, as well as our cognitive health, the way we think and perform cognitively. We take care of these building blocks, the rest will be improving as well. So we have, um, this is an, a, an example of an ergonomic um, alignment. It's pretty basic. I can't um, make it as specific as I would like when speaking to over 100 people, but there's some, some quick, quick things. So whether you've learned that you're going to be working at home longer than you'd hoped, or you're heading back into the office in a new space, I would suggest having a look at your postural alignment while working. This is for office work. I know not everyone works in an office, so apply what fits your situation. In roles where we aren't sitting at a desk most of the day, that alignment for brief sitting tasks is less critical. But if we are gonna be spending full days sitting at our desk, we need to make sure we're lined up well. And we might be just feeling that from these awkward spaces we've been using uh, as we're making things work. So the quick and basic, uh, simple, there's gonna be a handout to emailed to you where this photos come from. It's from the Government of Canada and it goes through some steps of ergonomic assessment and tips. So I typically start by looking at the least adaptable surface. Usually this is the desktop or in some cases with a keyboard um, on the desktop um, or keyboard tray. So I try to adjust the person's chair to allow the forearms to be parallel to the floor. Um, so while, where their keyboard lies, I want their, their arms to be able to be parallel to the floor. So I, I bring the tray up or chair up or down to meet that. Then, um, if, if, if on the other hand you have an adjustable keyboard tray, I would start with the chair actually, because the keyboard tray is, the, is quite flexible and it can meet you wherever you are. So if I was starting with the chair because of a keyboard tray, I'd lower your chair down so that your feet are flat on the floor and your thigh bones are parallel to the floor. You've got approximately a 90 degree angle at your knees. 
And then I adjust the uh, keyboard trait to meet you where you are so that your hands are, so your arms are parallel with the floor in typing. Adjusting that keyboard so your, your elbows can be sitting by your sides and your forearms can be parallel to the floor. And then I adjust the rest of the chair. Um, back angle, we look at having 90 to 110 degrees. I more often kind of go in the slightly open angle, slightly open from 90, uh, because it allows gravity to help keep us upright, rather than if we're too bolt upright, sometimes we tend to slouch forward. Adjust the armrest to meet you where your elbows naturally fall when sitting upright. And then the next step is to adjust your monitor height so that the top of the monitor is somewhere in the forehead range. Most people have them a lot too low, so I'm most often bringing the monitor up and that naturally has you looking straight ahead rather than down. Monitor risers and stacks of books can be useful here to bring that monitor up. We're looking at an external monitor. And similarly, if you're looking at, a, if you're using a laptop, I typically encourage people to have a separate keyboard tray and mouse so that they can then elevate the laptop to have that monitor height. Because laptop users tend to look a lot like this while they're working. That adds up. That's not how we're meant to do things. So thinking back to that PEO model, that's the environment. But we can also look at the task or occupation in the PEO model. So how are we doing the tasks? For example, standing and walking during phone calls, splitting up certain demanding tasks, setting a timer to remind us to stand, stretch, have a glass of water or a snack. Just advancing the slide. Hmm. Sean, I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Well, there it is. Okay, social and emotional. Again, what can we expect and what can we do? This is our mental health area. Again, I expect a full range of effective responses, affect, um, being mood and that sort of thing. Some people will be apprehensive to return to work, whether at home or in the workplace. They may be worried about the risk of contracting the virus, bringing it home, or maybe they're worried about whether or not their coworkers have been as careful as they have. I've seen a lot of social tensions arise over the different responses to COVID or a lot of the other things we're seeing in social media. Some friendships have been lost over this, and I can imagine there are a lot of people that are worried about encountering these conflicts at work because we have less control over who we work with than we do over how, who we socialize with. Some people will be thrilled to be back at work because being at home alone or in a house full of chaos has been really hard. They may miss people or may be excited to spend an hour alone in the car driving to work. Perhaps there have been some significant financial strain and they're keen to get back on track. For some people, their marriages were struggling before this and being home together under all of these pressures has really brought to light the challenges. So expect a variety of things. I've been in OT for enough years to work through a few economic crises and I found that many folks off work worry about coming back to work from a leave only to be let go because their company has had to downsize. That can create a lot of apprehension in that initial return. The transition can be hard on kids um, because of transitioning to childcare, adding on fears of the kids exposure to the virus and now needing to send food, changing up the routines and other changes, challenges could be difficult and there are fewer childcare spaces available so or family choices have led to people opting to try to juggle childcare duties between two working parents taking turns working on different days expect variety so solutions and tips what can we do about this advancing oh there it is Oh, this is another one too. Um, 
this is about this is a, a resource I put together for actually at the beginning of COVID when when we're, I was kind of thinking about how people getting off routine could lead to a lot of mental health um, implications and so there will be a download for this and also a weekly version coming in the email to you after but this is a, a tool people can use to prepare to go back to work now at this point as well so what are the routines that you need to be maintaining in order to be effective at work, taking care of, of yourself, taking care of your family, feeling productive, um, trying to start to simulate some of those routines before you go back can make the transition a little easier. This next one is on work values. Oops. Uh, this is a great strategy. I think, and I think values are a good strategy to help us in a lot of situations, help us know how to cope. So on an individual level, taking some time to note what your work values are can be helpful. How do you want to show up in your role at work? How do you want to behave? What do you want to be known for? How do you, how do you want to be perceived in, in the work environment? Do you value humor, creativity, efficiency, interpersonal relationships, generosity, solving problems, reliability, compassion? These can be your lighthouse. When the fog rolls in and you're not sure what to do and, and things are getting a little bit stress or stressful, figure out what's most important to you and, and try and move toward that. And I would say as a return to work practice, it can be helpful to spend some time on this and then write down some of these main values. How do I want to show up at work today or this week? Put them somewhere that will remind you. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's a little note that you put on your desk. Maybe it's some timers on your phone that remind you, hey, how are you connecting with your value of creativity today? Or even part of your routine uh, upon arriving to re work or review these values or listening to podcasts that remind you of these work values on your way to work. And then notice at any given moment, am I moving toward these values or am I moving away from them? And if you notice yourself moving away, such as in avoidance, procrastination, isolation, um, or acting opposite your values, then be intentional in making a small towards move. So sort of unhooking from why you got stuck in that away move and make it a small intentional towards move. For example, if it's important to maintain positive, supportive working relationships to you, relationships, relationship building is important to you, then maybe if you notice yourself avoiding and isolating, you might make a towards move by sending a message to a coworker to arrange a walk during your next break or ask someone just how they're managing. So diving into this sense of noticing whether we are moving toward or away from our values in our actions, this can help us in a variety of parts of life. And it's part of a model called acceptance and commitment therapy, um, which is referred to as part of a third wave of cognitive behavioral therapies. If you want to learn more about that, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, so looking up acceptance and commitment therapy can help. So in ACT, we encourage people to build psychological flexibility. Flexibility is important here with all this ever-changing world that we're in right now and circumstances. Uh, so building flexibility with a lot of self-compassion and the mindfulness skills of opening up and making room for things that come up, being in the present moment rather than swept away with challenging thoughts and feelings, being curious and observing yourself in the situation, as well as taking committed action, making towards moves towards your values. There's some great presentations on the Wello COVID-19 webinar page, as well as under the web mental health resources tab that will teach you a lot of other mental health skills too. Um, this is the topic I could probably talk for a year about. Other ways that we can prepare to manage our mental health in the transition are routines that support physical health, as previously mentioned, sleep, nutrition, exercise, these things all create a good foundation for improved mental health. Having some guidance to try and build those routines before we go back is important, not just wait until we get back there. For people who are nervous to go back into a building or be around the people, you might need to warm up with some gradual exposure. So 
being able to, to get near that workplace, go spend a little time, go to the coffee shop nearby that you usually go to, sit on the bench. If you're able to go in, go in. Um, practice that as often as possible to rewire those connections. The more we avoid things that are fear provoking, the bigger the fear gets. So I often recommend frequency over intensity. It's more it's better to go back and try these things frequently than it is to immerse uh, fully in the in the thing. Just practice, 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 and you you can go a little further each time. Anticipate and plan. Uh, there, I really enjoyed the neurohacking presentation um, that's on the Wello site. And um, I often will talk to clients about maybe even making a little kit of things that can help your brain be at its best. So for me, some earbuds and, and earplugs, a little note to remind myself of some grounding strategies, stopping when I get a little stressed or even every once in a while to notice five things I can see, four things I can touch, three things I can hear, two things I can smell, notice the taste in my mouth or have a mint, curiously strong mint ideally, that can help get you back into the present moment. Even a little bit of chocolate for some good neurochemicals. And as an employer, advancing the slide. All right. Um, there's a lot out there on creating psychological safety. And now this is just, isn't just our employer's responsibility. As employers, managers, supervisors, team members, we all need to remember that business is human and humans perform well in environments that support them. So there's a link coming in the email afterward um, that uh, from the Harvard Business Review, that's where these, this list has come from. Um, so a few tips from that article approaching conflict as a collaborator, not an adversary. So what does winning look like here? Does winning look like I win and you lose? Or does winning look like we find a solution? Speak human to human, because after all, business is human. Anticipate reactions and plan counter moves. So that can be sort of anticipating different ways this conversation can go and how you might handle challenges as they, they come up. Um, replacing blame with curiosity. So rather than looking for that solution or looking for who caused that problem, we're trying to look for how do we be curious and, and figure out what's going on? How do we solve this problem? Asking for feedback on delivery, measuring psychological safety. There'll be more on that in the article. Next slide. There we go. So, in terms of cognition, we think I think of it in two ways. There's sort of the types of thoughts we have. Um, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Um, I'm going to be a failure. It's going to be a disaster. Things aren't going to go well. But then there's also that cognitive performance, how well we do, um, how well we think, different types of thinking, concentration, attention, recall, alternating attention, problem solving, and so on. So we've all lived different lifestyles over the last few months. And again, I think this is going to show up cognitively in a variety of different ways, just like it did physically and emotionally. Some people will thrive with the changes and transitions or after having taken some time to pause and restore those people with burnout, particularly they might be coming back doing a little bit better. There's also this optimal level of nervous system arousal for cognitive function. So if our nervous system is sluggish and under aroused, we may have trouble getting started on things, sort of that um, sluggish and sleepy. And then there's that high level of nervous system arousal where we are anxious and we can't think very clearly. We've sort of flipped our lid, lid and our cog higher cortical functions are not working properly. And we're kind of in a panic. We can't think very well at either of those ends of the spectrum but there is this sweet spot in the middle where a certain amount of stress helps us to perform optimally so not all stress is bad and i think it's good for us to remember that so some of the people that were a little bored with their work before they may be coming back with a little bit of stress a little bit of edge that might energize them to be a little bit more effective i think that we'll find some brains are not quite at their best 
sort of like a muscle that's out of shape. If you haven't had to think quickly, shift focus between tasks or stay on tasks for long periods of time, or hold multiple bits of information in your mind while performing another task, you may not be good at it, uh, as good at it as you used to be for a while. It's temporary, it'll come back, don't worry. It'll come back just like your endurance would if you stopped running and needed to start running again. So some solutions for managing brains that aren't at their best. I think it's important to remember to apply all the coping strategies that you would if you were starting a new job. So reviewing policies, writing things down, making lists, blocking tasks in your calendar, reviewing processes. Don't count on your brain to do all of these for you. Be intentional in doing these things. It might seem like you didn't need to do them anymore because you knew your job backwards and forwards, but there is a lot of newness here, and don't be afraid to, to use those tools. And also remember, taking care of your physical and mental health, the sleep, the exercise, the routine, the nutrition, emotional regulation, social interaction, these all support your cognitive ability. When our bodies and our spirits are not doing so well, our brains don't do so well either. So taking care of all of those things helps each other, helps the different areas of function. Um, some people may need little tricks to initiate tasks. I love uh, using a timer for something that I've been procrastinating on, but I'll set a timer for 20 minutes and I'm just gonna give her for 20 minutes. I'm gonna get started. I don't have to finish, I just have to get started on something. I typically finish it, but I need a little trick to get myself going, particularly on things that I'm not feeling great about doing, that I don't wanna do. I want to end on this next one. So we've got lots of time for, for questions and there are some good ones in there. This next slide, this says that the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known lost and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people don't just happen. And I, I like to think about this in terms of resilience, that together we've gone through a traumatic experience and we can come out of this with more resilience and stronger. We just gotta get through some hard stuff and, and we've been doing it so far. So remembering that, that openness, flexibility, compassion, remembering to do those things to help us be, be curious and, and open to, to the changes that are coming ahead. I think we've got some questions. Yes, we certainly do. There's a number of questions that have come in, so we'd love to uh, spend some time answering them. And uh, um, a first question that came in prior to the um, webinar beginning is, my home office is more ergonomic than my downtown office. Any suggestions on managing the switchback? That's an interesting one. I've heard more of the opposite. So, um, and, and I think it's, it's more, it's about talking to your employer. What can you do? What can you do to match? You found something at home that works and what can you do with what you have at work? Or can you switch out some equipment to make things work a little better? There's always a lot of great bootstrapping that goes on in, in ergonomics. And I think there are a lot of ways that we can, that you could try and recreate what you have at home at work, but being open with your employer, they want to support you. Um, is a good place to start. Another one again about going back to the office. How do I manage being back in the office when many of my coworkers or the rest of them are still at home? Mm. I think that mirrors a lot of what we saw in the beginning too, where some people were still working and other people were off. And I, I remember seeing a lot on social media, of, oh, I'm doing this course and I'm doing this exercise class and look at all these things I'm doing and I'm, I'm kind of going, wow, what? I'm still working really hard here. Is everybody else on vacation and, and I'm still working? So I think, I think it's, it's again that, that openness, that flexibility, uh, focusing on the things you can control and the things you can't. You can't control what the other people are doing, but focusing on your wellness and well-being and ways to connect with your friends as you transition is, is where you've got some control. So managing those factors and trying to detach a little bit from the things you can't control. Excellent. There's one here that I'm going to, I'm going to answer uh, as well, Carolyn, and it's about uh, getting to work. 
So a number of people, um, you know, certainly some cities, the only way to really get into work is through public transit. And uh, many people have some anxieties and fears around that. And it's interesting to see that a lot of uh, jurisdictions now are actually imposing that mask wearing is, um, is essential on public transit. So if you just go back to thinking about the virus, it's a respiratory dro droplet spread virus. So if you're wearing um, a mask, if you can guarantee that you can be six feet apart, you don't have any risk if, as long as you're in an environment where there's not wind and it's blowing into, into your face. But if you are six feet apart, then you're not going to be at risk. But in a public transit situation, that just really isn't possible. So that's where wearing a mask is important. And it's really important that everybody wear the mask in that situation because the mask is really protecting the people around you, um, not you. So the mask wearer is protecting those around you and the people around you, if they wear masks, are protecting you. So we really want to encourage that in a situation like public transit to be safe, wear a mask, and we're glad to see that many jurisdictions are mandating that, that mask wearing in those places is important. The one thing it will also do is when you're wearing a mask, it prevents you from handling and touching your nose and mouth. And uh, as long as you don't start rubbing your eyes, those are the, the kind of ports of entry for that virus is through those mucous membranes and your eyes, nose and mouth. So by wearing a mask, you actually can prevent those inadvertent touchings that we do of our nose and mouth and face on a regular basis. So wearing that mask in public transit where you might be holding on to a, a bar or a seat, uh, you know, a, a seat handle or something of that sort, again, you don't want to be touching your, your face after that. So I would say mask wearing, hand sanitizing when you get off that public transit. And when you're wearing a mask, really important that when you remove it, you hand sanitize, you remove it, you dispose of it and hand sanitize after because that mask may now be contaminated. So there's a lot of things around wearing masks, and I think we will see more and more of those in those congested public spaces as we get into our relaunch. So uh, I hope that helps, you know, in terms of uh, affecting, uh, you know, the ability to use transit going back into the office. So I have another question for you, Carlin. Mm -hmm. I have settled into a routine now working from home. How long will it take and how do I reset my routine going back into the office? I think it'll, it'll vary. It, it depends too on how, um, how consistent that routine was and, and how um, much you're able to do your previous routine at work. So certain routines are easy just to pick up where you left off. Um, but we don't know what we're going to expect. So I would suggest trying to practice your work routine and, and include the parts of your at-home routine that have been working really well for you. Perhaps you started meditating or, um, or, or going for a walk in the morning. That set you off on a, on a good beginning. Start practicing doing those a little bit earlier so that you can work them into your work routine. But being intentional about it. I think a lot of us sort of think, oh, oh that's too bad, it's, that's all over. Um, but it's not. We can be intentional about how we move forward. It just takes a little bit more planning and, and careful preparation. Yeah, and I think I've heard this from many of our speakers over the course of the, uh, this pandemic is that part of the issue with even starting to work at home is establishing some of those routines. And yeah, now yeah. I think people are sort of into those routines at home and are worrying about the opposite. Now, how do yeah. I go back into the workplace and establish new routines? So what I hear you saying is that you can kind of get the best of both worlds. You may have established some things working in your home setting that you never did before, perhaps starting your day with meditation or some practice or taking a stretch break through the day. And maybe those are things that we can start incorporating as we return into that workspace. Absolutely. I think, I think that um, there, are, there are a lot, and somebody actually just posted a question too about uh, practicing mindfulness, right? That there, if there's, mm -hmm. these are things that we're practicing, there are a lot of apps and, and podcasts and different ways we can continue to learn um, as we transition into the workplace to support that, um, these, these shifts. I think that, I think there's a, a, a gift in um, that everything got shaken up and there's a potential for us to come out a little bit better than if none of this had happened.
around. And that's the stuff resilience is made of, right? That, that, we, that we go through a challenge and we can find a way to come out a little bit stronger and a little bit more confident in our ability to bounce back um, and finding ways to, to reflect on what this is mean, meant to us. This wasn't just a, a pause. It was, a, it was an opportunity to reflect and consider what's most important to us and, and what we can be doing to help ourselves. I think there's a lot to I think you're so right. And uh, for many people, it's a bit of a reset. And if we look at how maybe our business or our workplace was structured or how we structured our lives, you know, we can now step back and say, well, having learned or reflected on what the last few months have been like, what would I stop doing now? What would yeah. I start doing now? And what would I maybe do differently going forward? So it's a good, a good chance to look at those things. Another question, Carlin, can you review the four, three, two, one steps to reset mood? Would you like to do it together? Yes. Okay. So the way, this is a grounding strategy that is about bringing us into the present moment and we can do it anywhere. It's really easy to do out in nature where we're seeing novel and new things or looking out a window, but we can do it anywhere. And I often teach it to people by taking turns. Um, so Wendy, if you're a game, um, that we could alternate in first identifying, and, and this is again with curiosity, openness, non-judgment, so we're not necessarily saying, hey, I see that wood grain and it's really beautiful. I see the wood grain, I see the swirls. I, we're not putting a judgment or evaluation on it, just being open open to what is there. Um, so five things we can see. I can start with one thing I can see is my keyboard here in front of me with uh, the S button is a little bit um, smudged. I must use that one a lot. Now, Wendy, what's one thing that you can see? Well, I think I have a bit of an unfair question here because I'm sitting in a medical office, so I'm seeing <laughs> lots of medical things. Uh, <laughs> I can see uh, certainly um, all of our medical tools that we use, a blood pressure cuff, an ophthalmoscope, and all of the tools that we use daily in medicine. Wonderful. So you listed a couple things there. So we've done three so far. Um, I can see uh, there's a window beyond my laptop where I can see some trees out behind me. And people who are watching, I challenge you to find five things you can see at the same time as well. Now, Wendy, what's one more thing you can see? And I see a painting on the wall that's quite lovely. Excellent. Good. And then the next is that sense of touch or feel. And this is, this is more of a tactile, not necessarily, oh, I feel pain, but more, I feel this texture, I feel this pressure, I feel the wind. Um, so I feel the hard uh, seat on my chair. Your turn. Yep. And I have a, a nice sort of soft uh, fabric uh, leather armrest that my arm is resting on. It feels quite lovely. Excellent. And I feel the, um, the texture of my mouse pad that's really smooth. It's and the hard surface of a desk. Wonderful. And next we go to the sense of hearing. So three things we can hear. I can hear some birds in the distance. I ran away to the mountains. I don't know if I mentioned that. <laughs> what do you hear? Um, I guess the hum of a noise cancelling machine going in the background. <laughs> and I hear um, my finger, uh, the, the sound of my finger on the texture of the paper. So that was three things we could hear. You now two things we can smell. I smell um, a smell of shampoo. What do you smell, Wendy? Well, we just had a little bit of disinfectant in here, so there's a little lingering over of that. Excellent. And sometimes you can even find something to smell. So I have a little smelly that I like, and I could smell notes of lavender in there. So that's two smells. And then just noticing the taste in your mouth. For some people, you might grab a mint or just notice. Like, I can notice a little bit of uh, the taste of the crackers I ate before the session. What do you taste? 
nothing right now. So. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. So that's five, four, three, two, one. It doesn't have to be in any particular order. It's just about getting into your senses and making it enough of a fidget to, to occupy you, bring you back from some challenging thoughts or feelings and into that present moment. Feel a little bit more grounded and present so you can then carry on and doing something that's important to you. We don't have to, sometimes we have a lot of negative thoughts and that can be really natural in, um, in a stressful situation. I don't actually have to turn every negative thought into a positive. It can just be that, it, that you're nervous to go back and that you're feeling worried about this particular element. And we don't have to talk ourselves out of that. Sometimes we just need to make it a little less sticky so that we can, by making room, by being present and curious with it, so then we can continue to proceed in the line with our values, solve the problem, figure things out. Mm -hmm. There was a question about in an office setting, what would be a brief way to get into mindfulness in the moment? So that five, four, three, two, one is perfect. Just observing something. I've done this with clients too, that you just, you can even just look at your hand and, and, and just bring yourself back to that present moment, noticing the lines, noticing how the color changes when you, when you press and then open, um, noticing the different textures. Is it, is it warm? Is it cold? Is it moist? Is it, um, do you have a tan line from your ring? Just, you can do all sorts of observing of anything. Grab a plant. I like to do this with plants I love plants and and just being able to you can smell you smell an earthy smell do you feel the texture of the leaves do you notice how there are some new buds do you notice um, that that it needs some water just just being present pick something something to, to get present with there's some great apps um, I enjoy apps like the calm app or 10% happier headspace there are a lot of great apps out there lots of them have enough to practice that's free um, that you don't have to go and buy the whole thing there's some a lot of good practices just getting curious present open flexible excellent another question is can you give some tips to address deconditioning mm, yes I can. Um, deconditioning is the thing that happens when we become less active. Um, so we get, we get weaker muscles, which can lead to some aches and pains as our body tries to stabilize in the places that, um, that have lost stability due to weakness. And um, I think a lot of us are facing decondition unless we really intentionally got out. I wasn't a formal exerciser. Um, in recent years and so I had to really be intentional to get moving because a lot of my natural activity came from going and meeting clients in the community and going for for walks because I was out and about walking at the mall in between sessions a lot of that stuff stopped when I was seeing clients back to back on my computer at home and so I've become deconditioned and I've noticed a few more aches and pains my back's a little sore than it was and and so I did I booked in to see my physio to, to build some strengthening activities that are, are targeted to my areas of pain. But a lot of this stuff's just coming back with getting back into the swing, being less afraid to get out and, and walk and engage, um, trying to find ways to be creative if you can't access your regular gym. But we can recondition just as well as we could decondition. It's just a little harder. Excellent. And love to have your um, answer to this one. How do you handle people who don't follow COVID etiquette? For example, they're not, they're coughing or sneezing in their hands, they're touching their faces, moving too close to you for comfort. This has been a hard one for me because I, I so it's a hard one to answer. And I mean, I think that there are a lot of people who, um, feel a strong adherence to the recommendations and, and regulations because it's but what's being presented to us and then there are a number of people who sort of doubt it and feel controlled and feel um that you know sort of their their rights are being infringed upon by you know this thing's not that bad more people died of this than covid that sort of thing and, and i'm finding it hard to manage those things socially but i think in a workplace um it's up to the employer to set the tone for the safest option. And so 
I think everyone just being open to that. I think I think of the wearing the mask, like you were talking about, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. I think of it as a compassionate act. And if I can think about it more as me caring for you, because maybe I'm not as concerned about it, but I'm concerned, I can appreciate that you're concerned about your elderly parents or your, your children or your immune compromised status, that I can do this to care for you. And, and shifting that from feeling that it's an injustice to feeling that it's a caring act can help, but not everyone's gonna do that. And, and I think we, we need to find ways to support, um, support our workplaces in creating safety. So we've talked about psychological safety, but I think this is an aspect of physical safety and, and the employer needs to be the leader in that so that people aren't necessarily having to be too subjective in choices to um, manage safety guidelines. I think it's also being honest, you know, whether it's with a friend or a family member or a workplace, um, if you're uncomfortable, I think it's important to state um, without judgment or putting anything upon anybody, but just stating that I'm, you know, I'm uncomfortable when, when we are within that two meter distance right now. And I'm just going to ask um, that, could we just separate a little bit farther? Just, that's my comfort zone. I think just being, you know, being, uh, being honest and open with people and in a work setting, of course, you know, with your manager or with people who, um, you know, can help you establish the, the rules within that workplace. I think sometimes a, using humor too, right? Like just being able to kind of say, hey, you're in my two meter bubble. Do I need a hockey stick? <laughs> like you can, you can make it kind of fun, right? And it's just a way of saying, hey, I'm, I'm following this. And so please respect that, right? And, and you can do it in a lighthearted sort of way. Absolutely. There's um, someone who's asked a question and uh, we didn't get to it in the last week or two, but um, I will ask it now, even though it's a, a little bit, you know, we can actually translate it into a workplace, but it's best practices. You know, can I go visit a family member, a cousin or my mother at her house? And if we go there, can we share a meal or not? And what do I do on arriving? You know, wash my hands, not hug, etc. And I, I think really, if we go back to those basic principles that are, are guiding us through all of this, and we follow those principles, it will tell us what to do. So first thing is you don't want to go if you're sick. You know, if you're unwell, you don't want to be going and visiting others, just like you don't want to be going into your workspace. And I think we also have to respect if we have an elderly parent or somebody, um, you know, uh, uh, anybody that we're going to visit who maybe has, uh, is a little more vulnerable, has a chronic disease or a condition where we want to be more protective of those. That might guide us whether we're going to go and visit in person or not. Um, sharing meals, we know um, COVID, the virus does not spread through food, but it's more the handling. So if you're going to share a meal, one person with clean hands would be the server. We wouldn't have multiple people picking up serving items and, and serving multiple people um, through different utensils. So one person designated to wash their hands and then serve and then wash again. Um, if you are together, you know, again, we are asking about that six foot distancing, that two meter distancing. So unfortunately, hugs, although they're wonderful right now, they're not in that two meter distancing unless you're 100% confident you've been in an isolated situation, um, then we want to respect that difference. But you can still get together safely. We know visiting in an outdoor space where there's more air circulation, um, you know, can actually be better than a very closed environment. But, you know, we, we, we are social beings and it's important that we have those social connections. So we, we can still visit, but we need to follow those, uh, those guidelines. And I think that's an important um, premise even of entering the workspace. You know, we, we know that even though there are loosening of restrictions, we have to keep in mind those basic public health workspace and let those guide us. So we do stay home when sick, we wash hands frequently, practice the social distancing or in a work setting, masking if that's not uh, able to be 100% guaranteed. And those are the principles that should be guiding us as we go through these reopening stages. So any other questions there? There are some that have come out on sleep and I'm purposely not answering them because we have uh, Carolyn Sanders with us next week and she's going to be addressing sleep issues 
100%. We're calling it sleep boot camp. So anybody who's been struggling with, uh, with some of the sleep issues through COVID, be sure to join us next week because uh, Carolyn will have some uh, amazing uh, tips and things in the sleep boot camp next week. And I do want to mention that anybody who signed up for this prior to Monday, there was a bit of a glitch in the system and it may not have registered you. So if you did want to attend next week's uh, sleep boot camp and you registered before Monday, please go in and just re-register. We'll make sure uh, that you get in for that. So I really would like to thank you, Carlin, for sharing your knowledge, your expertise with us today. Um, very interesting to see it from both the mental health and the occupational health perspective. And I think some great tips uh, in order to consider how we navigate going into this next phase of the pandemic. This is really new for everybody and uh, we just appreciate the, the advice. Thank you and for I the opportunity. I appreciate having had this opportunity to connect with you and, and your audience. Great, and I also wanna just thank everybody for joining us today. And remember to uh, send those positive thoughts and positive images to our hashtag Wello community. We wanna continue uh, bringing optimism as we move forward. So thank you and we'll see you next week. Thank you.